Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang recently pointed out in the government work report that 2023 is the first year to fully implement the targets of the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China held last October. It is necessary to solidly promote Chinese modernization, accelerate the construction of a new development pattern, comprehensively deepen reform and opening up, and vigorously boost market confidence. What efforts had China made in expanding opening up, promoting reforms, and improving the environment for foreign investment? In today's missions and divisions, I'm glad to be joined by John Ross, Senior Fellow, Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, Zemin University of China, Daru Gape, a National Board Member of the Australia-China Business Council, Mohammad Zamir Asadi, News Editor from China Desk, Independent News Agency of Pakistan, and Bradley Blankenship, a Prague-based American journalist, political analyst, and freelance reporter. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the discussion. John, I will start with you. Uh, the Premier Li Keqiang has talked about uh, the Chinese determination to continue to open up and reform. And of course, in the high quality development, modernization, et cetera. Uh, you can see the focus on the uh, say consistency in terms of opening up and, uh, and reform. Tell us why it is so important for China to continue to open up the economy and the reform the economy. Well, it's because it's been the basis of China's success ever since the reforms of 1978. It's not a new policy, it's a strategic line. Of course, the circumstances in which it's implemented change. Uh, the, it's also particularly important for the world economy in China at the present time, because unfortunately, the United States has gone in the wrong direction under Trump and has been sort of clo closing down. I mean, the fundamental thing is if we go right back to the origins of economics, um, we can go, you know, right back to Adam Smith. We know that the international, the division of labor, including international division of labor, is the basis of economic growth. I mean, the great point of the wealth of nations was it showed that all countries benefit from international trade and China's opening up, therefore benefits China's economy and it benefits the world economy. It's particularly important at the present time, of course, because the international prospects for the 2023 are not particularly good. The IMF predicts the US and the European Union slowing down sharply and China's going to be the fastest growing major economy in the world. It's already accounted for about 36% of world increase in output since the pandemic started. So therefore, the continuation of this policy of opening up is, is crucial for China. It's brought a big success, but it's also crucial for the international economy as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Bradley, you know, how do you characterize the global economic situation? It seems like China continues to embrace globalization, economic integration. Well, we are seeing that uh, U.S. in particular, uh, of course, to a certain degree, some European countries, they are working on decoupling on this and that sector. Uh, how will that probably affect the global uh, or Chinese economy? Uh, this is going to force China, you know, particularly with a high tech war against China, it's going to force China to outcompete the United States on key technologies because one way or another, the market will move on. So Chinese companies that rely on this technology, computer chips and so on, will have to either adapt or sink. And I think companies like Huawei and ZTE and so on don't want to sink. So they're going to have to move on. And inevitably, that's going to democratize the global tech market by forcing Chinese companies to adapt. Um, what you mentioned about Europe as well, you know, as somebody who lives in Europe, I'm seeing, for example, in the Czech Republic, we're at over 15 percent inflation year on year. We can see that following along with, you know, essentially the U.S.'s deglobalization process has, uh, you know, there's one report that, that, that was quite, quite uh, important to me that I read that said that that household uh, poverty in the Czech Republic will be over 30 percent this year. So this is one of the most prosperous countries countries in Europe and the European Union with perennially perennially the lowest unemployment rate seemingly overnight becoming 30 percent poverty rate, which is is just incredible to me. So I think that, you know, China is setting a very good example of, of you know, doubling down, tripling down, if not quadrupling down in globalization, leaning into multilateral trade. Uh, to be the engine of economic growth 
for the rest of the world. And I think that's great. I think what the West is doing is horrible and it's leading us down a very bad path. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Mr. Asadi, you know, uh, looking at the Chinese economic growth plan, you know, and also the global economic situation, uh, for example, based on the prediction from World Bank or IMF, you do see the developed world, uh, the, you know, the slow economic growth probably, uh, or even recession in some countries. Uh, so in a sense, it is important you know, for Chinese economy to continue to grow, in particular for the global south or developing countries here. Everyone in the international community is very excited uh, just after the readjustment of the COVID-19 policies and about the work report that is, uh, you know, being uh, presented by the Prime Minister Li Keqiang. Uh, it shows that the remarkable achievements are there about the Chinese nation and um, there is um, uh, a, a, a new era and the new path is going to be evolved in the Chinese uh, 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 nation in the coming years. So I think definitely the happenings uh, in China have an important on the international community as well, either it is about the economy, education or other sectors. So I think Chinese economy is one of the engine of the global economy. And uh, China's, uh, you know, 3% GDP increase in 2022 is important to the world economy. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, I think Chinese economic growth demands a considerable amount of raw materials and uh, products, which will boost the world economy's growth. Uh, Daro, you know, by, uh, you know, 2022, we see China had uh, set up like a 21 pallet uh, free trade zones and the, of course, the Hainan free trade port, the Hainan province, the island. Uh, as a pilot field, uh, you know, as pilot zones, you know, of opening up, you know, what messages do, do you see, you know, do China's free trade zones send to the world? Setting up the free trade zones is important from the physical trade perspective. But from my perspective, I see that the most important feature of the free trade zones is the changes in trade settlement and cross-border trade transactions. Now, this is all tied in with the development of the digital economy. And this is the direction that China is going. This is the advances that China has made during the COVID lockdown periods that has been ignored to a large extent by the West. It's beginning to worry the Americans considerably. So the tree, free trade zones are important from the physical trade, but they're also particularly important in the way that they are trialling blockchain certification of customs clearances, the Chinese digital currency, CDC, and the use of it for trade settlement and the increased efficiency of cross-border transactions. I think in terms of the free trade zones, these are the most significant features. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, you know, if you look at the number of uh, negative lists in the national and the pilot free trade zones, uh, you do see there's a narrowing, uh, of course, you know, for those who are not familiar with this, uh, so negative list basically means that the area uh, restricted for uh, foreign investment. If you have a narrower uh, negative list, that means like more uh, market access in terms of uh, investment. And the national pallet free trade, uh, the neg negative list uh, is narrowed, reduced by 51%. And uh, so, and also the you know, free pilot free trade zones negative list narrowed by 72% uh, respectively. So that's quite a, uh, impressive, I would say, uh, you know, narrowing uh, of the you know, shortening of the list. So what's the message? How important is that in terms of uh, drawing uh, direct uh, foreign investment? Well, it's become, China has already become nor normally the second largest input inward destination for foreign investment in the world, sometimes the first, but no normally at the present time the second and by far the largest of any developing country. And this is showing what is the judgment which companies are making about what is the development of the economy. I mean, there is a small industry in the West which sort of predicts uh, disaster uh, for the, every year for the Chinese economy. Although at the moment, they must be said they're in euphoric mode. I have to, I watch Bloomberg every morning over breakfast because I want to catch up on the markets. And six months ago, they were full of stories about doom and crash in China, which were inaccurate. And now they're all about how China's going to lead the entire world economy forward. So they don't have a very stable analysis. But what is very stable is what companies do with their money. Um, you know, I used to I, I advise companies for my living, and I know that they have to take very serious financial decisions. And the fact that China has got such a large inflow of foreign investment shows that they are very uh, convinced that the Chinese economy is going to continue to grow. 
as I say, it, it is accounted so far for about since during the pandemic, about twice the percentage of the expansion of the world economy as, as the United States. And obviously the narrowing of the range of, um, of the na negative list means that foreign companies are more able to participate in this. So if you put together a combination of the world's most rapidly um, expanded major market um, and um, a, a narrowing of the negative list, this should be very supportive of foreign investment and companies have shown that they're taking advantage of this and they're much more reliable as I say than what, what you can read in the newspapers and watch the money as the phrase goes. Mm -hmm. uh, well Bradley you know uh, sitting in the European country you know uh, you know we are seeing of course in China increasing interest in investment in China uh, in particular probably institutional investors for example in the in the money market or financial market there Despite all the talk, all the media coverage, most of the time negative, unfortunately, because of the geopolitical tensions uh, between China and the West, in particular with the U.S., do you see? You know, there's, a, I mean, in, in, in the industry, uh, industries, for example, uh, in Germany and other countries, do you see the growing interest in China in terms of investment, in terms of, uh, you know, doing business uh, or continue to do business with China? Well, I, I do, and I think that's why a lot of European leaders, even if they won't say it, really want to get through the comprehensive agreement on investment that's locked up in the European Parliament right now. You know, I think that that would do a lot of good for Europe's economy. You know, as we're seeing now with the sanctions against Russia, this is essentially leading to the deindustrialization of Europe. We're seeing, you know, the prospects of a lot of joblessness and, and things like this in Europe, and I think that Europe needs a lifeline wherever it can get, and signing through the CAI would be a great thing. Uh, I think, you know, uh, some major American banks have, have predicted that, first of all, by 2030, China's economy will be the largest in the world. But moreover, China's uh, consumer market will double by that time and be pr probably about the same uh, size as the United States is right now. So if you know, you know, if Europe's largest trading partner right now, or was the United States, but is now China, I only see that growing. You know, as, as Chinese people want to consume European goods, luxury goods, and things like this, I don't see why we shouldn't have the CAI in place right now. Uh, well, Mr. Asadi, if you look at uh, the potential, you know, for uh, to growth uh, in terms of uh, foreign trade between China and other countries, for example. Uh, if you look at uh, Chinese trade with the countries along this Belt and Road uh, initiative, you do see uh, there's an increase or yearly uh, average of 13.4%, uh, you know, more than 13% uh, growth. Uh, that's quite impressive. And of course, uh, uh, China, uh, you know, as a part of this uh, RCEP, uh, basically mostly ASEAN countries, including, uh, of course, plus uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, Japan, so-called regional comprehensive economic uh, partner, uh, partnership, you do see the, the potential is being unleashed. Uh, so, yes, uh, in a way, you know, U.S. is uh, sort of decoupling with China, but we do see stronger growth probably uh, between China's trade with the rest of the world. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, the countries involved in these two, you know, like Belt and Road Initiative and the RCEP, they do not have any kind of geopolitical issues or tensions with one another. They do not have any historical baggage on one another. They are just sincere to one another, uh, just to increase the trade volume and just to, uh, they, they are thinking about that, how they can bring and create the benefits for the betterment and for the well-being of their people. So it is the only agenda, it is the only cause. So I think that uh, RCEP and the BRI have laid a strong foundation for the countries um, and China to broaden their cooperation in, in economic and, uh, you know, investment area. And definitely the West and the U.S. and the other countries that are, um, you know, adopting the approach of unilateralism, they will definitely be worried about it because China is, uh, you know, helping a number of countries under these, uh, you know, uh, 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 under these two platforms. And China's uh, economic, you know, strength and the China's economic assistance is assisting many countries to revive their economies. And uh, China is inviting, you know, many countries uh, to import uh, the products from these countries in the in the expanding and in the opening up Chinese market. You know, Chinese market is such a huge uh, market of the international uh, at international level, and and it has a huge potential of uh, for the international organizations um, across the globe.
Bradley, uh, as uh, Daryl mentioned about, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, of course, uh, there are, uh, there's a presence of projects under that initiative in European countries too. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not about building military bases. Basically, China prioritized, you know, doing more business, more investment, more trade, because China believes it's mutually beneficial. Uh, the, the parties participating in the initiative or in cooperation uh, will benefit from such a practice. Uh, uh, so, of course, there's a, there's a negative impression, unfortunately, you know, because of, uh, you know, the media coverage sometimes, because of the political concerns uh, in some European countries. Uh, but uh, then again, you know, they are doing their own, uh, in a way, Belt and Road in Initiative in developing countries. So there is a need for more investment, more trade, more construction of infrastructures. I think that's definitely true. There definitely is. Uh, where I live in the Czech Republic, you know, there's a, there's a lot of problems. For example, with with trains here, and I think that um, you know, we we really could benefit. I think the Czech Republic is part of the Belt and Road Initiative, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I think that you know, a lot of countries in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, particularly where I live right now, could benefit. I also, to be honest with you, think that the United States could benefit with, from uh, this this uh, cooperation with China. You know, I grew up not too far from this area of the United States called Appalachia, which is very poor, uh, and people are, are very impoverished there. And, and what I've seen from China is not only poverty alleviation, but in the, the infrastructure that China's built is quite impressive. And I think that not only that, but the United States has a lot to learn. You know, I, I was quoted in Xinhua, I believe, last year uh, when it was reported by, by China's embassy that they had helped create about half a million jobs in the port of Boston by opening up a direct trade route from one of China's major uh, sea carriers to the port of Boston. And I think this ways not only for Europe to, to cooperate in the Belt and Road Initiative or just in general with China, but also for the United States, as much as we see in the media that this is somehow some kind of nefarious, you know, uh, Trojan horse for Chinese activity, I think that that you know, the United States as well could benefit and we can help create American jobs by cooperating more in China. And I definitely think that that's what I would like to see. And I think a lot of younger people as well in the country would like to see that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, join you know, along the line of, uh, you know, uh, having more trade and more investment. China obviously is a strong supporter of the World Trade Organization uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, multilateral, uh, multilateralism, uh, because uh, that's the, in the interest of the world. Uh, China has also initiated the establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, or AIIB, focusing on, you know, more investment in infrastructure, basically uh, in developing countries. Uh, uh, so, of course, uh, uh, it also puts forward this uh, Global Development Initiative, or GDI, and what do you see in the Chinese efforts in this multilateralism, you know, investment in infrastructure, or, or stress on development, in particular probably for the Global South, for developing countries? Well, I think it's particularly important for the Global South because if we look at the development of the world economy, the Global South represents an increase in pro proportion of the global economy. This is a, a long-term trend that's been going on for 20 years. And it's going to continue to do uh, continues to do that. So, so if you look at the chief locomotives of the world economy, therefore at the present time, number one is China. Nobody, it's almost twice as much as the United States, and far more than any other country contribution to expansion of global output. But the secondly is the collective global south. You have a number of economies there, which are becoming large, which are also going very um, rapidly. Um, India grows rapidly, Indonesia grows rapidly, the, the ASEAN has now become a trade block that's equal for China to the Europe and, and the United States. So this is the general development which is taking place with China. And what's very notable with these countries is that they want to pursue in the global south, they want to pursue their own independent policies. They, they don't want to have a fight with the United States. I mean, no country... You know, the United States is a powerful country. No sensible country wants to pick a fight artificially with the United States. But they're not going to be stopped from um, carrying on their own independent policies and developing relations with China. I thought it was very well put by President Lula, who's, of course, just been re-elected, in this case about Russia, but I think it was expressed in a general international view. When he was asked um, to, you know, supply for joining U.S. sanctions on Russia and supply military weapons to Ukraine, he said, "We're at war with poverty, not war with Russia." 
And I think he meant this, exactly the same thing about um, China. So what you've got to, at the moment is you've got a development of regional organizations in the global south, which ASEAN is the most successful. You've got si similar developments, less developed going on in Latin America and in Africa, and these have a big synergy with China. They're, they're not aimed against the United States, but they're not going to prevent, they're not going to allow themselves the development to be prevented by the United States, un unlike the type of chaos which is being created in Europe, where we've got the fastest inflation for 40 years, so the slowest growth and a big war uh, due to following the policies of the United States. The Global South wants to keep well out of that and it wants to have good relations with China and also, if possible, good relations with the United States, certainly. Mm -hmm. oh, Dario, obviously, you know, China is a force for globalization, uh, economic integration, because it believes, you know, it benefits from that process. It has benefited from that process. Uh, and most of the developing countries, of course, will benefit more investment and more uh, investment in infrastructure, for example, uh, more buildings, ports, uh, airports, etc. Uh, so if you look at the global south, I mean, uh, I mean, globally, globalization is sort of uh, in the retreat. But for, for, the, for the global south, for the developing world, I mean, globalization, I mean, there is still belief in uh, doing more business with each other. Globalization is only in retreat if you read some of the Western news media. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world knows that globalization is unstoppable. And the GDI initiative is part of that process. It's important to remember, I think, that the global south has a champion in China when it comes to adjusting the unfair balance that currently exists in world trade relationships and in the rules which are designed to protect some participants, not others. So this is an important challenge that must be met on a global basis if we're going to tackle global issues like climate change and so on. China sits in the leadership in this area, looking to expand the participation along multilateral lines that includes the global south and includes any other country which is interested in being involved. And this stands very much in contrast to treaties and trade arrangements that are promoted particularly by the United States, which are designed essentially to favour the United States to the exclusion of, of others. And it doesn't matter whether they are allies or whatever. So we look at Australia, for instance, and the subsidies on uh, solar panels and green development in America has a deleterious effect, a bad effect uh, on Australian industries in the same areas. So this is the key difference between China's approach to multilateral trade solutions. This is what underpins the Global Development Initiative. It's very, very different from the American approach, which is designed to protect trade rather than expand trade. Mm -hmm. uh, well, speaker of uh, China-US, uh, uh, Bradley, you know, in recent years, we do see the competition, mostly from the US with China, uh, in the field of science and technology, you know, has been intensifying, of course. The U.S. has uh, uh, promulgated, for example, the CHIPS Act, and uh, companies such as uh, Huawei you know, has been frequently basically sanctioned by the Washington. Uh, so what do you think of these uh, actions, you know, like CHIPS Act, like the continuous uh, you know, entity list, uh, expansion of the entity list uh, of Chinese company, somehow, obviously, affected the global supply chain? Well, you know, as I said before, I think the only thing that's really going to happen is that it's going to force these companies to outcompete American companies. You know, we're already seeing in the U.S. that innovation is dwindling, even though the United States is right now, you know, I would say the, the leader in technology. We have to understand that that the basis of, you know, Silicon Valley, for example, is built on foreigners. And with the way that the United States treats its immigrants and the way that it treats its workers in general, people don't want to go there anymore. You know, the, the Silicon Valley, it would be no exaggeration to say that, you know, it's based on Chinese, Indian immigrants and people from the former Soviet Union. But the way that, that the United States treats its immigrants, people don't want to go there anymore. And the way that the United States fails to invest in education in the long term, you know, the Biden administration, including the first lady, Jill Biden, has and uh, 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 Ned Hill or the, the National Security Director of, of the United States have already have already called this a national security crisis. I mean, I'm talking about our education. So in the long term, I don't think that we could compete with China. It's only going to force companies like Huawei, ZTE to push out American companies from the market. What I'm really sad to see, though, uh, on the on the flip side is how European uh, 
countries are following along with this. For example, I woke up today, I saw in the news that the Czech Republic has now labeled TikTok a national security threat. And in, in doing so, they said it was because of the amount of data that's going to China, the laws that exist in China. And in my mind, I just thought, well, you know, the, the data laws in China are actually stricter than in the EU itself. So that, to me, doesn't make any sense. And, I, and it's clearly because they're following the Americans. We also see here uh, the Czech Republic least recently released a paper saying that they expect that if they drop uh, carbon fuels completely by 2035 or whatever their goal is, that they, they could face energy shortages if they don't develop nuclear energy. And that's why they're expanding their nuclear power plant at Dukovani. <clears throat> China, Russia, France, South Korea, as well as the United States have all put in public tenders. But of course, the Czech Republic eliminated Russia and China due to national security threats, which obviously came from the United States. And former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo came here and tried to strong arm the Czech government to sign a deal, which would have broken the EU's free trade uh, regulations, favoring the United States. And the new ambassador to the Czech Republic from the United States said in his inaugural address when he came here to Prague that that is the first priority he has is to sign a deal on, on the Dukovani power plant. So what I'm sad to see is that there's other countries which are following along in Washington's agenda, which will inevitably make them fall back on technology. We've already seen how, you know, 5G technology across Europe has suffered by following the U.S. example. China has tried to introduce 5G to the Czech Republic, to the U.K. and other countries like Germany. But due to national security threats, again, emanating from Washington, it has kept us back not only the United States, but Europe as well. And I think that's very sad to see how, how Europe is, is just following the line of the, quote, transatlantic alliance. Mm -hmm. Well, Daryl, you know, in 2023, uh, many media outlets, including Fortune magazine, for example, uh, they reported the Chinese economy is expected to rebound strongly from last year's low base, and GDP growth will return to 5 to 6% uh, uh, this range. Of course, uh, you know, if you read the government worker report by Premier Li Keqiang, China is targeting at 5% uh, growth for 2023. Uh, so what's uh, your understanding? You, all, you see, you know, what kind of prospect do you see in terms of realizing the 5% growth goal? Oh, this is certainly achievable. But we must remember that as the Chinese economy matures, growth rates will inevitably decline. The challenge is to ensure that the slower rate growth rates still contribute to widespread prosperity. And this requires good social policy to support economic policy. The development of the digital economy is an important part of this process. And as we were just talking about, this worries the Americans considerably. So they engage in what I would call mafia style capitalism, where they try to kill the competition rather than outcompete the, co the competition. Now, policy. China policymakers are aware of these connections and they drive these high level opening up policies. China's responsibility is first of all to its own people, but we also must recognize that China's prosperity is also a major contributor to global prosperity. We're not going to see a general lift of global economy in the same way as we did in the recovery of 2008 but China's contribution to global, global recovery is going to be substantial and it will be in different areas. And that's part of what concerns the Americans at this stage. We are seeing tremendous advantages in the application of development of the digital economy and the way that this spreads prosperity within an economy that is not growing as fast as it was in pre-COVID periods at six or seven or eight percent. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, we conclude today's missions and visions. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.